love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. of God I love your voice you have led me through the fire and in darkness and night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh, so my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will say. think about the goodness of God. The scripture says to bless the Lord, oh my soul, and not to forget any of his benefits. We're in a time today where it's hard, it's difficult, and it's challenging, but I believe praise is a way for us to focus on the good things that God has done for us. 
the blessings that he's poured out on us. So let's make a decision today to bless the Lord with your soul. Bless the Lord with your strength. Bless the Lord with your finances, with your family, with your job. Why don't you lift your hand right where you are, lift your heart. Come on, lift your song. Let's choose to praise God for the good things he's done for us. Come on, let's lift it up. faithful to us you've never left us alone you've never forsaken us and we thank you for it so good. Good evening, networking family. Um, I'm going to read a couple verses from Romans chapter four, and then I'm going to ask Santakla to lead us in a time of prayer <clears throat> right after the scripture. Romans chapter four. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. That's what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. 
he was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. In verse 25, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Um, Santacla, would you lead us in prayer at this time? Father God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for life. Father God, at, um, in such a time as this, O oh Lord God, when we need you, Father God, every generation, O oh Lord, we are realizing that we need you more than before. Father God, I strongly believe that my generation needs you more than uh, Pastor Grant's generation. We are more evil. We are more bad. Oh God, we've invented way to disagree with you. We've invented ways, oh Lord God, hallelujah, to sin against you. We need you badly, Savior. We need you badly, Lord. We need you in ways that we never thought that we would have needed you before. My Lord, my God, we have sinned against you altogether. All of us, oh Lord God, we've sinned against you. We have known what was right, Father, and we've, we've decided not to do it. We have known what was noble. We have known what was godly, O oh Lord God. For years, for centuries, O oh Lord God, we've decided against what was right. And now, Father God, righteousness is like a gulf between us and it, O oh Lord God. My Lord, my God, we are begging you in the name of your son, Jesus, graft we back together, put we back where we belong, begin to nudge, oh Lord God, the heart of our leaders, the heart of our incoming leaders, oh Lord God, oh Father, to stand um, for you, Oh, Lord God, I, there's going to be men of God going in and about this fallen country, it seems. Father God, I have seen you causing the heart of leaders to seek uh, um, the wisdom of elected men of God. Do it again, oh, Lord God, not for our sake. We are too bad. Santacla is too bad, but for the sake of your name, for the sake of your name, for oh Lord God, for righteousness sake, in the name of Jesus, open up our heart. I have, I couldn't wait. I could barely wait, Father God, to receive my most important daily bread. Prepare our heart, Father God, to learn about the subject of righteousness in the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Um, it's good to have you tonight um, joining online. Thank God for you. Um, if you have missed any of the services, last night was financial um, coaching or empowerment, and on Tuesday was Bible study, please go back on our Facebook page, um, NFCM Family, and you can see the broadcast there. Um, I saw Sister Mona on Zoom a few minutes ago. It's good to see her tuning in. I know that she wasn't well earlier this week and um, into last week. And we thank God because the prayers of the righteous are effective and powerful. And so we are still declaring that we are in hot pursuit of righteousness and love. 
And uh, that's our declaration for 2021. And so at this time, Bishop is going to come and he's going to teach the word of the Lord tonight. God bless you. All right, everybody, great to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for prayer. Let's be mindful that this is our moment when we are taking time out to um, uh, pursue, pursue righteousness and love, very important. Now, we, we, we are starting now to get into the real meat of this. Um, so, um, I noticed Sister Mona is on somewhere, on one of these media houses and so on. So all of you believers that are here, welcome. Great to have you. It's devotion time, and we are continuing to look. We have to build up ourselves in our most holy faith. And so these evenings are to build us up so that we be strengthened, to be locked away and from outside the company of believers and others can be very discouraging and painful mentally. So we really want to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. So thank you for being here and for joining and for making sure that um, um, we are together virtually. Um, now, um, we want to continue viewing righteousness. It is not a word that is a curse word in the generation. And I just heard Santacla was praying for that, and I was very moved by this because every time we get to a generation, he said, um, I, I am far moved from this generation. I presume when you get to 61, go in 62, uh, you belong to a different generation. He just reminded me. So um, thank you, sir, for reminding me of my generation. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I want to acknowledge. Um, something fundamental the, the 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 command to be righteous or god's provision of righteousness is not um men changed over time it's level ground it happened at the cross and every every generation every culture every jew or gentile all require righteousness why righteousness produces life produces prosperity and produces honor. If you bear those three things in mind, we're going to keep focus. And so we're going to try to make those very real to you. Amen. Life is companionship with God. That's what that life means, whether it's here or tomorrow. So eternal life is being with God and, and, and actually having uh, the life of God in you. And the, 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 the gateway or the doorway into this life is God's righteousness. You have to be in right standing with him. The challenge is, how do we become righteous? Given the fact that, as, as we just heard in the prayer, I um, mean, uh, Santa, Santa prayed there, you will recognize that we have invented every form of sin. And as such, one of the major things that has been bothering humanity is what is called truth. Um, we have not, we have taken away ultimate or we have taken away absolute truth. And we have now denied what is revealed or manifest. And that is, we, we see it with our eyes, but we don't believe it. And there are other things um, that when truth comes out there, or there's another approach we use, we suppress it. I don't want you to know about it because in case you know about it, you will be freed from me. And that is what we see in the culture today. And he was just praying about this, that most of what is known as the truth of God is being suppressed. And we have power brokers that suppresses truth. And the third thing about truth that is very, very dangerous in the world today is that there's a substitution of truth. In other words, we are now in a woke culture and a woke time in which I can invent my own truth. And I can call, so now we're in a generation that this is my truth and what is your truth? And everybody has a truth. And so now we are fragmented, we are divided because there is nothing to pull people together. And that is why we could not at a better time view the theme of righteousness more efficacious, more important in the lives of God's people. 
And so we're going to touch a little bit tonight when we're going to talk about the, 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 one of the nice things we say about Abraham is that he's the father of faith. But that is only like 50% of the deal because it is what faith brought him, which is cardinal to understand tonight. And that I hope we can break that up tonight so that instead of just saying Abraham, the father of faith, we recognize what was the benefit of this faith. And the Bible is going to explain this very well into our spirits tonight. Amidst anything that you can garner or gather into your barn, into your heart, into your soul this year is the blessing of righteousness. To know righteousness and to believe God for God's righteousness. Notice this, God's righteousness. We have church righteousness. We have pastor's righteousness. We have all types of righteousness. Jesus said to his disciples, let your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. What Jesus meant there, have the God righteousness, and by so doing, you will exceed the righteousness of the religion or of the culture. And so, brothers and sisters, how do I judge righteousness, Pastor? You see, one of the problems we have is that we take scripture at face value. And when we want to beat people over the head, we quote a scripture. <laughs> well, folks, it wasn't meant for that purpose. Scripture was meant really not to bring people into bondage, but to release people from bondage. It is the truth, and truth sets free. And so, when we preach to others, we got to be careful here that we are advancing the truth of God. We can't make it up. We can't apply it in ways that it ought not to be applied. It's the truth of God. And so let's deal with the gentleman we call Father Abraham. And we're going to testify tonight that he is our father. That's what scripture wants to tell us um, that Abraham is now. Let's go to chapter four. I think this is the uh, um, amplified version of the scripture. So I'm holding two Bibles here tonight and I'm looking at them. Now, the word of God tells us, now remember in verse number one, what are we saying about Abraham? Now, this is important to remember about Abra Abraham. Now, initially, his name was Abram. Abram, A-B-R-A-M, Abram. And uh, prior to him becoming Abraham, uh, this is very important, God had this discourse with him. And this is pivotal to understanding how transformation happens. Because the idea of faith in God produces a transformation of our very nature. So in Abram, that name meant exalted father, exalted father. But after his interaction with God and faith at work and him becoming righteous, God actually transformed his name unto the father of nations, the father of nations, father of many. Amen. Praise God. This is important. you got to understand this in the name of Abraham. Prior to that, he was just an exalted father. And the strange thing about that, he was a barren. <laughs> he was called the exalted father and he had no child. Can you believe this? <laughs> then God shows up, transformed him into Abraham. Now the guy who, was, who had no children and was known as the exalted father. Can you, can you see the paradox or the, the conflict there? And then God shows up and said, well, guess what I'm going to do? Although there's an inability in you to produce children, I am going to make you the father of nations. Not a nation, nations. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, most of the things that God says does not only happen in the physical, it happens in the spiritual. And so you got to understand this. So from the physical perspective, he produced nations through his loins through both his, uh, uh, not just both his sons, he had about seven or so 
uh, um, sons in totality, but through but the seed, the spiritual uh, um, offspring would be through Isaac. And so um, Ishmael and the other boys, they were not the, 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 the lineage through which Messiah would come. And so after the birth of Isaac, we really paid more attention to that blessing, that Abrahamic blessing that then had to pass on from Isaac, then it went to Jacob, and from Jacob it then went to the 12 sons while he was in Egypt, and from there the generation took off. Uh, man, we're talking about almost 400 years, my friends, before this happened, but the promises of God are yes, and they're sure in Christ Jesus. So that's the first thing to note in verse 1, that um, the Bible refers to him as our forefather, speaking from the flesh perspective. Um, um, verse number two. Now, remember, um, Abraham wasn't a goody two shoes. Um, prior to Abraham, we said he was Abraham, and he lived in a place known as or in Chaldea. Today, we would say somewhere around I I Iraq or within the borders of Iran, right where we have those. Um, uh, uh, historical rivers and things uh, on the other side it is called now so he was from there and there the god that was worshipped was paganism he was the sun god and so um, we believe that it, it, it's out of the, we could really talk about babylon from there because ultimately his descendants went back there to live babylon amen um, now when you are called of God, you leave Babylon. It's very important if you're a dreadlocks or a, Rast or a, or a Rastafarian in Jamaica, you say, you born Babylon, you know. <laughs> oh, man, I don't like to get this way because I, you know, Rasta used to say a whole bunch of things, my friends, about Babylon. But the idea is this, I put it this way, God called Abraham out of Babylon, Abraham, that is exalted father. Um, Babylon represented um, the place of demonic activity, the place of paganism, the place of defeat. When God calls you into his promise, he changes your nature and he makes you productive. He transforms your nature and he makes you productive. If you backslide and return like hog to the walla and dog to your vomit, God sends you back to Babylon. That happens in the life of the Israelis. And they found themselves right back in the bondage in what is called the exile. And they were right back in Babylon. Now, when Abraham got out, now every time that God moves you from an era of paganism, from sin, demonic activity, it is important that if one is to come into relationship with God, you cannot be accepted on your own terms. God does not accept you and I on our terms. We can't come to God and thinking that we can set up how we come, what we do, how we get accepted. No, totally impossible. The, the, listen what the scripture says in Hebrews 11. Those who come to God must believe. Now that's important. Okay, Hebrews 11, 6. Those who come to God must believe that he is. That's number one. Number two, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That word seek or pursue him. Oh, praise God. Now we're going to grab a hold of verse two. So Abraham was coming out of idolatry, out of worshiping devils, uh, you know, you could be you know, multiple craziness in his life, living apart from God. He had to experience what is called justification. That is, he had to be declared by God to be righteous. What was required on his part it is God who calls the person. But when God calls you, the person who comes to him must believe. What, what should that person believe? That God is. 
That word is important. Eternal, the I am. Ever living God, God is. And number two, he's faithful in his promises. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What, what is it? Everything he has promised, he will do. Even 12 midnight. Oh, praise God. Whatever God promises, God will do. <laughs> Hallelujah. So then, Abraham was then justified, you know what that word is again, declared righteous. In other words, he was considered just because God acquitted him. He was found guilty of his idolatry. He came out of idolatry, my friends. <laughs> it's, he wasn't born righteous like the rest of us here. Santa Claus was just praying for that. Amen. Now, The idea that the, the apostle espoused is that it, it wasn't done because he did some marvelous works and God was ecstatic and God is saying, yeah, you scored a hundred, so I give it. No, that, that's not how that worked. Before God, it's not about performance. Now, does God value performance? Yes. But when it comes to the matter of salvation, being saved, being delivered from the power of sin and satanic oppression, sickness, disease, and death. God does not predicate that grace on your works. If you look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, the Apostle Paul in speaking to them, this is how he records this. He said this, amen. Uh, um, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's very important. Awesome. Now, so then in verse 3, the word declares that what Abraham did was to believe trusted, had places, confidence. We said before, when we speak to faith, we talk about the love, the wisdom, and the power of God. The love, the wisdom, and the power of God. So when Abraham believed or trusted in God, amen, it was about omniscience, it was about omnipotence, and it was about the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Now, remember Hebrews eleven six. those who come to God, remember Abraham was called of God, he came to God, must, must, must believe. Uh, Kerry, can you pull up uh, um, Hebrews 11, verse 6 for me? I want, I want the believers to read this with me um, um, tonight so that we can, we, we can get this uh, um, strong and then we'll go back to that very... Uh, um, uh, um. Now... Now, it is impossible to please God, to satisfy God, when there is no faith. The text says, but without faith, an absence of faith, zero faith, negative faith. It is impossible. Let's look at the word impossible. Uh, now, you and I can never be pleasing to God, can never be accepted by God, can never be received by God outside of faith in God. Now, the second part of the text says, whoever would come near to God must of necessity believe that God exists. Now, this is not just like God is locked away in some room there, somebody. That's not the idea of the existence of God. <laughs> It's an active participation of a God who creates the universe. All things are made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. When we talk about that God exists, he's the I am. He's the one who sustains the universe. He's the one who provides for the universe. I and mean, we, when we talk about God exists, we're talking about that the rain that falls, an expression of his his willingness to care for his creation. We see him in existence as we have church, that he's the head over the church. We see him in, in our families. He's the, as the husband, he's head over the wife, says Christ. Said, 
So when we talk about the existence of God, we talk about his vigilance and his continuance in the affairs of men, women, girls, boys, in every culture. So God exists. So this is not a passive statement. When we believe that God exists, it means, therefore, when you believe. Now, now let's just say something else here. If I want to go to Africa and I am boarding, I, I'm, I'm asking that my flight be booked, we're going to talk about airlines that are going to Africa. Now, I can't just sit at my house and say, well, I believe the airplane will take me to Africa. And then I realize that I'm in Africa. It doesn't work like that, my friends. The airline will surely get me to Africa. Then I got to cough up some money and we got to book a ticket. In other words, and we got to go sit in that little thing or that big thing, whichever one you choose to get into. And you have to spend the time and the hour and it gets you there. The idea of believing in the existence of God is not just to say, well, I know God exists. That is, that's a passive statement. And in that, your faith would not be activated. The people who believe, praise God, that God exists are the same people who believe that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly and diligently seek him. They pursue him. Oh, that's where we want to go. Um, and if we go back to um, in Romans chapter 4. So Abraham was this guy, praise his holy name, that was in diligent pursuit of Almighty God. And the idea was this, that subsequent to his belief, so Abraham lived out Hebrews 11 verse 6. And then by doing that, God gave him a credit to his account. Now, I want you to understand something here. Many of you have bought houses before and so on. When you have your closing documents on your house, they borrow these terminologies and the business sector has done well to explain these things to us. What the business sector does when you're doing your closing statements on your house, they have two columns. They have what is called a debit column and a credit column. What if you're buying the house, so you have to spend some money, whatever deposit you put, you might find a debit take from your deposit or take from the mortgage that you already just got. Whatever the seller is offering to you, that is considered a credit and is put in a credit column. They then add up these columns and determine how much you should pay, how much you have gotten. It's basically what it is. Now, praise God. Hallelujah. Look at this, people of God. God, hallelujah, is willing to credit your account. <laughs> praise God. Now, years ago, we had a song in the hymnal we sang. Um, my old account was large, praise God, and growing every day. Why? Because I was always sinning and I never tried to pay. I was just thinking about this the other day. It's the first I fully grasped what this person was saying. In other words, because we're born in sin and shapen in iniquity, the moment guilt came into our lives, we were living on a debit account. Now, let's say you have an account in the bank with $5,000 and you're paying mortgage, you're paying car note, you're paying insurance, you're paying everything from that. And you decide, well, that's a lot of money. I'm not going to put any more in the account. So for six months, you're there thinking, well, I have enough money for six years. And then suddenly, you realize that after you have paid two months, some very nasty notes start to appear in, on your account. And you think, where is my money? Because what has happened is that you were running a negative account because there was always debit and no credit. Oh, sovereign God. I want you to hear this, my friends. Hear this, believers. As long as you continue to pay bills, one day your bills are coming back and you will have to pay up all the money that the bank had paid for you in good, in, 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 you know, while you had a good reputation or a good name. Because now you had used up 
all of your credit and you are now in negative status because of the constant debit. You know, the useful thing, and care if you can find me that song, um, um, let, me, let me tell you what it is. Long ago or something, long ago. Um, trying to remember this. I wanted, I wanted to show people the words here in a little while. Now, I want to mention here tonight that as long as we are living in sin, you are running a debit account and you have run out of credit. Now, what God is doing now is transforming the nature of our accounts. Praise God. Now, yes, so let's read the words here. Thank you. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven, an old account was standing. Look what this, for sins yet unforgiven. I mean, I'm running a debit account. So my name was at the top and that's the, the you know, that's the idea of getting a bill. Many things below all of the things that I'm guilty of, these were like taken away from the credit I was born with. Now, the, the, song, the, 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 the writer said, I went to the keeper, that is the person that is responsible for the, that, that's managing the account, and he said, I settled it. Now, to, the, 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 the chorus says, and the record is clear today. Why? He washed my sins away when the old account was settled. Now, Listen, the extent here. The old account was large and growing every day, for I was always sinning and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead and saw the pain and woe, I said I would settle, and I settled long ago. Praise God. Now, I'll, I'll run up to the next verse there for me. Um, um, Verse says, O sinner, trust the Lord. Be cleansed of all your sin, for thus he has provided for you to enter in. So if you should live a hundred years below, you won't have another debit account. That's what the psalm is saying. You will not regret it. Why? You settled your account. Praise God. Thank you so much. Awesome. Now, I want us to bear in mind tonight, and probably that's where we're going to stop and pick this up tomorrow, because I want this to be in your spirit as we go back to Romans chapter 4 believers that the, the the real challenge here that abraham received was what we call a declaration now there are times when you have run your debit account to such a state that you literally are bankrupt you are unable to pay now when sin comes in our lives we are bankrupt you cannot work long hard enough to pay or to reach the credited state where you can add to the account. Now, what is this account? The account we're talking about is life. The account here that we're talking about is prosperity. The account we're talking about here is honor. All these are eternal virtues that you can't work to attain. And the way to attain this is the way of righteousness. But our account is stuck in a debit state. And there are many people who just forget it. They can't pay. The bank is calling and they just forget it. And they try to open other account and they found they are stuck everywhere because they keep checking and they find out that, oh, you owe some money over this bank and you're trying to cut out to another bank. And there are times when there's so much back payments and people can't catch up. Some people just decide, well, I'm going to go bankrupt. You know, bankruptcy takes you through a period. And after you have gone through that period, then you can be declared in right standing after seven or so years. <laughs> Amen. Now, to get back to this, we, by virtue of life, we have become bankrupt. Because every sin committed every single day adds to your account. And your account is large and growing day by day. Oh, sovereign God. 
But what God does, he doesn't leave us in a state, my friends, where we are gone under with frustration and impossibilities here where you're thinking, my God, I can't get out. How am I going to receive life? How am I going to prosper? How am I going to get to a place of honor or where does glory return to my life? Because the Bible says we have sinned and fallen short of honor. We have fallen short of God's glory. And the Bible said, Abraham now reveals to us the path. When you believe and trust in the living God, he credits your account. And this account now is filled with life, filled with the power to prosper, and filled with honor. You have gotten God's righteousness not one of your own. So now you are commanded to live right because you are in right standing with God. We can't hate anymore. We can't treat people bad anymore. We have to love our enemies now. We can't be found in dishonor. We can't be found abusing God. We can't be found in idolatry. We can't be found stealing, whether it be taxes or anything else. It's time of year when we file taxes. We have to be upfront. We have to be truthful. Amen. Because that's we are in right standing with God. And that demands that we live in that context. Sinners sin. Righteous people do righteous acts. And so... You are righteous first. Your righteousness must precede righteous behaviors. In other words, your account has to be credited before you can start spending. And now when you're spending, oh God, your spending is in concert, amen, with the quality of your riches. And our riches now is righteousness. Hallelujah. Praise God. Father, I want to thank you tonight. Oh, praise God. Because, Lord, we had an old account. It was large, growing every day, for we were always sinning and never made attempts to pay. But when we consider the outcome of that, the, 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 the disaster, hell, when we consider living in a, a, a state of woe and content, when we consider the wrath of God, the vows of God's wrath, when we consider that you will never live eternally with sinners. Sinners have no place in your eternal presence. When we consider that, Father, that's repulsive. When you have made a way for us. And so tonight, as a ministry, as a church, we come to you, Father, in the precious name of Jesus, and we acknowledge we want to be found having the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Christ Jesus. One that allows us to forgive those who hate us and despitefully use us. One that gives us the quality of life that brings us into heavenly places in Christ Jesus. A righteousness that comes from God is of faith and by faith. Your word declares where there is no faith, we cannot, it is impossible to please you. Praise God. Tonight, Father, I declare confidence in Almighty God will arise in the hearts of your people. Holy Spirit of God. Faith will arise in our nation. My God. Faith will arise into those that are depressed, downhearted, disappointed. Faith will arise in those who are tired of a pandemic. Faith will arise in those, Father God, who have put confidence in man. But tonight they will recognize this faith is not in a human. For those who come to you, those whom you have called and are responding to the call, must believe in your existence, your active existence. Praise God in our lives. And that you reward those who are in diligent pursuit of Yahweh Sidkinu. 
Oh, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on your people right now. Hakia, Saya. Oh, hallelujah to the Lord. Muri Koyabo Saya. Mokoriabo Shiania. Hallelujah. Oh, praise be to the living God. Father, I declare in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. A conquering lion of the tribe of Judah will break every oppression, every chain, every bondage in and upon your people's lives right now. And that we will be a testimony of divine righteousness. Oh, that we may know you, my God, and the power of your great resurrection. Because we are made conformable unto your death, if that by any means we might attain unto the resurrection of life. That's why who you said you are, Jesus. I am the resurrection. I am your life. We thank you, hallelujah, for the life-giving power that emanates from Jesus. That comes through righteousness. Let righteousness flow in the church. Flow in your people's hearts. Flow in our homes. Flow in our country, my God. Hallelujah. Let righteousness flow. Let unrighteousness, evil, wickedness, transgressions be brought to judgment tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Years ago, I think one of our regular artists said, How long shall they kill the prophets? And so, Father, we know there is a desire, hallelujah, within the world to declare the, that your word is obsolete. And we declare, Amen, we are saying things because we have to murder the prophets in order to forward lies but we believe that is the time of triumphant living how do we triumph faith in a living God amen and I believe tonight tonight sovereign God those who believe you it will be accounted as righteousness Abraham believed you. So tonight, Father, we believe that you exist. We believe in your promises. Hallelujah. We believe, Father God, you cannot be defeated because you are God all by yourself. We praise your sovereign Lord right now and we give you thanks. In Jesus' holy and mighty name, Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. I want to give God thanks for those who are here tonight. Thank you. Sister Smona, how are you doing? Turn on your thing and tell here how you're doing. Uh, greetings, Pastor. Greetings, net networking family. I missed everyone, and I am doing so much better by the grace of God. Thank God. I always had every year I have a resolution. And this year on Wednesday was two days before New Year's Eve. I said, my New Year's resolution, it's going to be I have a closer walk with God and to study the Bible more because I want it to be closer. I want to have a clean slate. I want to start over this year and New Year's Eve, I was knocked out with this major headache. It felt like an elephant on top of And I could not figure out what was going on. And then I went to work the next day and my left side of my face had this pain shooting up to my temple. Mm. And I couldn't talk. I couldn't open my eyes and I was so scared. And my boss saw me. He said, I think you're having a stroke. We need to get you to ER. 
So in and out of ER for a couple of days, they diagnose as Bell's palsy. Mm. And I went back to the neurologist a couple of days later and I'm explaining to him that the headache moved from, now it's on the right side of my head and the pressure, it's so severe, I can't even open my eyes, I could barely speak. And he, they said, okay, well, go back to the ER and get yourself admitted so they could run tests. Nothing showed up in the CAT scan. And we spoke about that as well. And no one could figure out where this pain was coming from. A week later, I'm on all medication, two weeks. And it was only until this morning I woke up and I felt like that pressure had just like, it just disappeared. Mm. It just like, and I said, oh God, thank you, Jesus, because all the medication and all the diagnosis, everywhere I went, I was given a different diagnostics for the pain. But the dentist said it was the dental problem. The neurologist said it was some pre something in the head. <laughs> Heart issue. So I said, you know what? I am just fed up with all of this. I am just going to stick with my New Year's resolution, have a closer walk with God. And no matter what, I'm going to keep my faith. And I appreciate every one of you and your prayer. All my brothers and sisters for networking family, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your prayers, because prayer does work. No matter what the doctor says, we cannot, I mean, they could diagnose you with so many things, but if we have no faith and we don't believe in God, I don't know what would have happened. Mm -hmm. And I really, I, I know in my heart, prayer works and I give God thanks for that. And for every one of you as well who have continued praying for me, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Lady God bless you. It's great to have you much better and uh, may God in his divine wisdom uh, continue to be with you. Hello, Miss Dana, turn on your microphone and say hello. Uh, I haven't spoken to you in a few days. How are you? Hi, good night. Hi, Pastor, I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing very well, thank you. So I, we got the good news that um, Michael and yourself were planning to tie the knot sometime in the future. So tell us what's going on there. Well, we got engaged on January 2nd. Um, I, we haven't set a date as yet because, you know. That's, it, that's okay, as expected, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with COVID, we're not too sure right. that will work, but definitely no later than next year. That's for sure. <laughs> I know you You set real targets and you push towards them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 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 um, you love the gentleman, huh? I do. Wonderful. Now, folks, you see, I have to give you a little thing so you can smile because I like when my people make those um, moves and um, get your lives together. We're young people. God didn't call us to a life of fornication and adultery. He calls us to clean life and um, that life must be lived. So no matter what time in the culture we are. And so my heartiest congratulations on behalf of the church to Dana. Um, or I, I already met the gentleman sometime earlier on in the year. Haven't had a chance for any great interaction as yet, but she she tipped me off very early. So um, <laughs> I couldn't say anything because I did not get any okay to say anything. So I had to hold it. And so this has been for quite some time, but um, I'm pleased that they have made that decision and um, please pray for them. It's very important that God will guide their lives and give them a successful um, marriage and um Lots of babies and all this type of thing. Um, I, <laughs> I know she's not into two because I know mommy has about three or four. I came from China. Let's see, two boys, one girl. Okay, three. <laughs> so um, uh, she's going to do four or five, you know. <laughs> not five. Uh? Not five. <laughs> four. 
Four is the max. How much? Four is the max. I, I, whoa, boy, we will do good together, Dana. Thank you. That's really nice. You see, many of us grew up in Jamaica with this paganistic, communist thought that two is better than too many. That was birth before, long before you were born in 1970s when the World Health Organization had this crazy thing in Russia, of all places. And they came up with this idea that third world nation should not go beyond two children. And therefore, um, places like Jamaica, we had it on every board, we had it on everything on the radios and the television everywhere. Two is better than too many, two is better than too many. And then we got trained as nurses and we were called to pill for that lie. And we didn't know any better, we just keep humming it. And that's why I want a church that is, can think for yourself. Don't trust your government to think for you, think for yourself. Because when I came up now, I realized it wasn't God's plan that two is better than any too many. It's a lie from hell. And then when people had more than two, we almost treated, we almost despised them when they came into our health institutions in Jamaica. Because we thought they were going beyond. And who set this law? I think that was set in Russia in the 70s. But we were so dying for education that we accepted a lie. I don't want to get into that tonight, my friends. I'm just telling you, be careful of what government tells you, believers. Know what God says and anchor your faith on what God says and be able to use God's word to elicit the truth. Don't, don't ever go around trusting everything they tell you. Because when they're true, many of you should have had four children, five and six, and you end up with one and none and half because government was telling you. You know what people started doing? Aborting them when they got pregnant beyond those numbers. Today, Russia is, I mean, China is doing the same thing. You have one or anything over one must be an abortion. You think we're killing babies here? They're killing them a lot more in China. And China has become some of your gods. Come on, folks, wake up. We're in very evil times. Let righteousness be pursued. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let me give you the benediction. Amen. Lord bless you, my people. Thank you, Sister Mona. Um, I'm glad that we're talking not just a mere closer walk with God, but the theme of the ministry this year is righteousness. You cannot get any closer than righteousness. So you're right in line. Your, your theme is in line with the theme of your church. And so be here to study righteousness because it is the only I mean, thing in, in, you will find in the Bible that, that, that brings you into oneness with God. Righteousness. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Good to see you, Sarah. I think you're online. I haven't spoken to you in a while. And I think I see Seymour and Adam, the Canadian, is there. And Sister Glennis, I see you there. And Claudia and Beverly, hi. Say hi to your mom. God bless you, everybody, and keep you. The Lord bless you. I think Jew was on there, too. Uh, Jew, you're in the hospital still? I'm sorry about that, folks. I got to cut out and say hello to her. Turn your phone on and let's... Hello? Yes, sir. Oh, you sound pretty good. Say hello yes, to sir. Everybody. I feel better today. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your prayers. I really feel different. I mean, it's I really feel the hand of God even being here. And I just thank God for all of your prayers. God bless you. Thank you so much, baby. She's had major surgery and her husband is there. What a good time to be married. It was one year after she had her husband sitting in the hospital with her. That's the type of thing we like to do. Marry people and have them together. God bless you and keep you. It's good that he's there rubbing your cheek or your foot or washing your feet or something. And if he doesn't do it, then he'll have to answer to me. <laughs> All right. God bless you, everybody. <laughs> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his awesome countenance upon you. The Lord grants you peace. Oh, I love you, Networking for Christ family. God bless you, everybody. And hopefully tomorrow night we get a chance to talk with more of our people. We're getting back to normal as quick as possible. Pray that the church repair will continue. They are reviewing our documents and we are getting some reports, some things that the, that the, the contractor needs to work on. Please pray a little more, believers, that the city will, you know, give us okay to get our things done so they can come in because once they give us that in two or so weeks, we're going to wrap this up. Lastly, uh, Pastor Pierre, where we are, uh, you're using his compound now for um, Sunday morning worship at eight o'clock. Um, he's sending a container to Haiti and he's collecting all types of personal items and so on, anything that you have. 
um, I think the final day would be about Monday, but if you come into church on Sunday and you have anything you want to put in a bag and bring, please bring anything from food to clothes to anything at all that you believe they're good and can be used by our brothers and sisters and our people in Haiti. I just brought him a lot of stuff in the van today and I just want to keep giving him some more stuff. We are a mission-oriented church and we want to keep doing that. Amen. And uh, hopefully that I can find a few dollars to give him to help to pay for the container because it's, it's church doing missions. And if we can somehow help, we want to help. So whatever you have that you believe can be beneficial. The container is about to leave for Tuesday. Um, so don't call after that time, my friends. Just get it together now and let's give it to pastor. God bless you, everybody. Great having you tonight. We love you. Remember, the theme this year is love. You can't complete talking to people. We got to start enacting it. And even though you don't feel like you still love me, you got to keep telling me until you feel it once again. God bless you, everybody. Great. I love you, Pastor. I love you, Sister Paulie. God bless you. <laughs> okay. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless you. I love you, too. Amen. Praise his holy name. Yeah, I'm so glad to say Sunday, may I make a verse we go again. So. Yeah,